Chapter 14 of England and the Hundred Years' War by Charles William Chadwick Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Richard the Third, fourteen eighty three to fourteen eighty five. Edward the Fourth had been the father of a large family, but he had been cut off at so early an age that the two sons and five daughters whom he left behind him were all very young. Elizabeth, his eldest child, was only seventeen. Edward, Prince of Wales, his heir, was five years younger. Richard of York, his second son, was nine. It was obvious that several years of regency must elapse before the young king could take up the reins of government. Edward the Fourth had made no arrangements on his deathbed for nominating a regent, but there were only two possible persons who could be thought of for the post. One was the Queen Dowager, the other Richard of Gloucester, the first Prince of the Blood. It was at once seen that trouble would come of their rivalry. Elizabeth's success would mean danger to Gloucester, for her kindred, the Greys and Woodvilles, were old enemies of the Duke. But the game seemed at first to be in her hands, for her son was at Ludlow under charge of his uncle, Anthony Woodville, Earl Rivers, the chief of the clan. The Queen's kindred held the young king's person, and possession is nine points of the law. A less wily and resolute adversary than Richard of Gloucester would have yielded the game, but the Duke was a man of a cunning and ambition unsuspected even by those who knew him best. He had hitherto been known only as a good soldier, a capable administrator, and a most faithful servant of the late king. Unlike his brother, George of Clarence, he was a prince of a sober and cautious demeanor, and made public pretensions to piety which his private life did not altogether bear out. No one dreamed that he would prove the most unscrupulous man of his unscrupulous house, and that he was prepared to wade to power through streams of innocent blood. Richard was often pictured by Tudor writers as a sort of deformed and unnatural monster. They said that he was dwarfish, humpbacked, and hideous. But though his left arm and shoulder were smaller than his right, and his stature rather small, his exterior was not unpleasing. None of the line of York were wanting in good looks, and Richard's worst drawback was the shifty and suspicious glance which all his portraits display. He had only reached the age of thirty-one when his brother died, but his ability had never been doubted since the day when, as a lad of eighteen, he commanded the Yorkist right wing at Barnet and Tewkesbury. When the funeral of Edward the Fourth had taken place, Lord Rivers proceeded to bring the young king up to London. There it was intended that his coronation should take place, and that the council should nominate a regent or a protector to carry on the business of the realm. When the royal cortege arrived at Stony Stratford, it was met by the Duke of Gloucester and his friend and supporter, Henry, Duke of Buckingham, the lineal representative of Thomas of Woodstock, and the younger line of Edward III's descendants. Rivers must have noted with some alarm that the two dukes had brought with them armed retainers in numbers that were wholly unnecessary for the occasion. But he did not suspect how near was the blow that he dreaded. On the next day, as the cavalcade was starting again for London, Gloucester's retainers laid hands on Rivers and on Sir Richard Grey, the Queen's second son, and threw them into bonds. April 30th, 1483. They were hastily sent up to the Duke's northern stronghold of Middleham, while the young king was taken on to the capital by his uncle. Queen Elizabeth saw that her cause was ruined and took sanctuary at Westminster. Her eldest son, the Marquis of Dorset, and her brother, Edward Woodville, fled to France. Gloucester, meanwhile, on arriving at London, dismissed the ministers and appointed partisans of his own to their places. He then summoned Parliament to meet, proposing, as men thought, to have his nephew duly crowned and himself appointed protector. But soon an incident occurred which showed that his designs were not so simple as had been supposed. There were in council many magnates who were glad to see the Woodvilles driven away, but wished for no further change. 
the chief of them was lord hastings an old and faithful friend of edward the fourth gloucester seems to have spent some days in sounding these men to see how far they were ready to follow him when he was clear upon the point he arranged a dramatic scene the council had met in the tower and the duke seemed all smiles when suddenly he withdrew for a moment and then returning with a changed countenance began to declare that he had discovered a plot against his life sorcery was being practised against him he said and he asked what should be done to those implicated in the matter the queen dowager jane shore the late king's favourite and certain others whom he would not name hastings much surprised and somewhat alarmed faltered that if they had so done they were worthy of heinous punishment i tell thee they have done it and that i will prove on thy body traitor thundered the duke he struck the table armed men rushed in and hastings was dragged down to the courtyard and beheaded on a log at the same time lord stanley rotherham archbishop of york and morton bishop of ely were taken into custody june thirteenth fourteen eighty three having purged the council of the young king's true friends gloucester was omnipotent he now proceeded to further measures of ominous significance edward's younger brother the little duke of york was taken out of his mother's hands the queen being half cajoled half frightened into letting him quit the sanctuary and join his brother in the tower thus gloucester had both the heirs to the throne in his power he then began to pack london with armed men drawn from his estates in the north to whom were added those of his fellow conspirator buckingham it seems that no one save this young duke and perhaps john lord howard knew how far gloucester's designs extended their aid had been bought by enormous gifts the protector had granted to buckingham the custody of all the royal castles in wales and the west country and promised howard the duchy of norfolk to which he had some claims in right of his mother the plea on which richard had determined to strike at his nephew's right to the throne was that edward the fourth's marriage with elizabeth woodville was invalid he maintained that it had been celebrated in private and without the proper ecclesiastical forms which was pretty true and also that edward had been previously betrothed to lady eleanor talbot a statement for which no real corroboration has ever been found the princes therefore he said were illegitimate children clarence had left a son and a daughter but his attainder in fourteen seventy eight had corrupted their blood and they could make no claim through him richard himself therefore was the very sure and true heir of the house of york this preposterous theory was first set forth by the duke's chaplain dr shaw in a sermon at st paul's on june twenty second on the twenty fourth buckingham made a harangue to the same effect to the mayor and aldermen of london at the guildhall overawed by the armed men about them the citizens made no objection on the twenty fifth a larger meeting was held to which all the peers in london and many other men of note were bidden a petition was laid before them to which they were requested to give their consent it implored gloucester to assume the crown as the only true representative of the royal house to their eternal disgrace the assembly bowed before the display of arms in the streets and not a voice was raised to refuse the petition gloucester after some hypocritical show of hesitation assented to the request contained in it next day he was proclaimed king and on july sixth was crowned under the name of richard the third the moment that he was certain of success the new king had sent orders to the north for the execution of his enemies rivers and gray they were dead before he was crowned but their faction was not extinguished it had only been taken unprepared by the extreme swiftness with which richard had acted before he had been a month on the throne a conspiracy was already on foot to overthrow him and restore edward v its chiefs were thomas gray marquis of dorset lionel woodville bishop of salisbury and thomas st ledger who had married the king's sister anne richard got wind of the conspiracy and thought to frustrate it with ease by the most abominable of expedients 
he hastily sent word from warwick where he chanced to be at the moment to order the secret murder of the young princes in the tower the wicked deed was done on or about the ninth of august fourteen eighty three the boys were smothered and their bodies hurriedly interred under a staircase where they were found nearly two hundred years after when some repairs were in progress in sixteen seventy four it was soon known that the princes were dead the feeling throughout the country was one of horror many atrocities had been committed during the wars of the roses but not one that could vie with this it may be said that richard ruined himself by it no man whose heart and mind retained any regard for righteousness could serve the tyrant faithfully for the future usurpation was one thing the gratuitous murder of innocent children another from this moment onward richard felt that every man's hand was against him not even those on whom he had heaped the most lavish gifts could be trusted the best proof of this was that the conspiracy far from being crushed by the crime in the tower gathered force from it and was joined by many who had hitherto held aloof chief of these was the duke of buckingham who had hitherto acted as richard's right-hand man though he had been given all that he had asked he cast in his lot with the rebels not urging his own claim to the throne which was not much worse than richard's but consenting to back that of another for the conspirators hearing of the death of edward v had resolved to rise in the names of the houses of york and lancaster combined elizabeth the eldest daughter of edward the fourth might marry henry tudor son of margaret countess of richmond and heir of the beauforts his lancastrian claim was a poor one but the only one that could be brought forward no one thought of urging that of the distant queen of spain in october fourteen eighty three the insurrection broke out buckingham raising the welsh border while dorset st leger and the courtenays mustered their retainers in devon and other leaders unfurled their banners at salisbury and maidstone the earl of richmond with some mercenaries hired in brittany was to land at plymouth and head the rising for the last time in his life luck favoured richard an extraordinary and prolonged downpour of rain checked the communication of the rebels and so swelled the severn that buckingham could not cross it to join his friends richmond was beaten back by storms and was unable to land the king meanwhile with such levies as he could raise struck right and left at his foes buckingham's welshmen dispersed and he himself was captured and executed november the second his failure awed the rebels in the south who made no stand against richard st leger was caught and beheaded by his brother-in-law the rest of the leaders escaped to france richmond returned to brittany without having set his foot ashore the failure of this first movement gave the king a short respite of eighteen months they were a time of trouble for every one knew that the attempt would be repeated at the earliest opportunity richard lived in a state of miserable suspicion knowing that there was treachery around him but generally unable to strike for want of full knowledge when he could lay hands on a foe he made away with him even descending so far as to hang the unfortunate collingburn a wiltshire squire whose offence was that he had composed the rhyme the cat the rat and lovell the dog rule all england under the hog in which richard's ministers william catesby sir richard ratcliffe and francis lord lovell as well as the king's personal badge of the white boar were held up to scorn the parliament met early in fourteen eighty four and a considerable parade of benevolent and constitutional legislation was made but richard's position was too uncertain to allow him to carry out any real reforms having for example allowed benevolences to be formally abolished for he was a few months later in such dire need of money that he had to have recourse to them again in spite of his handsome promises perpetual alarms of rebellion and the need to retain his supporters in good temper by lavish gifts conspired to keep his pockets always empty in april fourteen eighty four the king's position was notably weakened by the death of his only child edward whom he had created prince of wales compelled to name an heir in his stead 
Richard selected his nephew, John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, the son of his eldest sister. He could not fall back on Clarence's son, a more natural choice, as to do so would have falsified his own claim to the crown, which depended on Clarence's attainder. Not quite a year after Prince Edward's death, his mother, Queen Anne, the kingmaker's daughter, followed him to the grave. Her end is said to have been hastened by her husband's ill-concealed intention of getting rid of her by divorce or otherwise, in order that he might marry a wife who would bring him another heir. When she was dead, Richard is said for a moment to have thought of marrying his niece Elizabeth, the elder sister of the victims of the tower. But the universal horror expressed by the nation, and brought to his notice by his own most trusty followers, caused him to abandon the horrid project. When the summer of 1485 had come round, the exiles who had never ceased to weave plans for a second invasion tried their fortune once more. Henry, Earl of Richmond, had borrowed a little money from the French government, and with it had raised some twelve hundred continental mercenaries. He sailed from Harfleur on August 1st. With him were the last survivors of the old Lancastrian party, his uncle, Jasper Tudor, Earl of Pembroke, and John de Vere, Earl of Oxford, as well as the representatives of the Yorkist factions whom Richard III had crushed, headed by Sir Edward Woodville. It seemed foolhardy to attack England with such a small force, but the invaders knew that their way had been prepared for them, and that aid would be forthcoming from many secret sympathizers. Landing at Milford Haven, they were soon joined by some of the Welsh gentry who gladly rallied round the Red Dragon of the Tudors. When they reached the Severn, the retainers of the old Lancastrian house of the Talbots, earls of Shrewsbury, came to their aid. But still, when they faced King Richard at Bosworth Field in Leicestershire, they could only put 5,000 men in line against the 14,000 in the royal host. Nevertheless, the Earl of Oxford marshalled his men in two small columns and led them uphill to attack the king. His confidence was justified. When the clash of battle came, half of Richard's army refused to close and hung back. The rest fought feebly, save where the king himself and his one trusty partisan, John Howard, Duke of Norfolk, maintained their ground. Ere long, a fatal blow was struck by two old Yorkists, Lord Stanley and his brother Sir William, who had pledged themselves to aid the invader. Coming on the field with fresh levies from Cheshire and Lancashire, they attacked the royalists in the flank. King Richard's army at once broke up with shouts of treason. Seeing himself betrayed, the usurper refused to fly, and setting his face toward Richmond's banner, cut his way as far as his adversary's person, before he was borne down and hewn to pieces. With him fell the Duke of Norfolk, Lord Ferrers, and Sir Richard Ratcliffe, the rat of poor Collingburn's rhyme. Of the victorious army less than a hundred men fell, of the vanquished no very great number more. The whole matter had been settled by treason and not by hard fighting. August twenty second, 1485. Richard had climbed to power by treachery, and by treachery he met with a righteous retribution. His body, stark naked and pierced by half a dozen wounds, was thrown across a horse and sent back for burial to Leicester, the place from which he had gone forth in royal state on the previous day. Thus ended the Wars of the Roses, one of the most sordid and depressing epochs in the history of England. They had begun in a justifiable attempt to displace a corrupt and incapable ministry, but soon they had become a mere blood feud between the great baronial houses. A yet worse stage had been reached in the struggle between Warwick and Edward IV, when the personal dislike between a selfish and ungrateful king and an arrogant and unscrupulous subject kept the realm disturbed for year after year. They closed in the most disgraceful scene of all. Peers and people had accepted a bloodthirsty and hypocritical usurper as king in a moment of unworthy panic, and only got rid of him by deliberate treachery on the battlefield. England has suffered more misery in other periods. The Wars of the Roses passed lightly above the heads of the citizens and peasants, 
and were only fatal to the quarrelsome baronage but she has seldom or never been in a worse moral state than in the years fourteen fifty five to fourteen eighty five the constant and violent changes of rulers the unending chain of attainders and executions the easy swearing of allegiance to one king and another the enormous part played by treachery and bad faith in politics had swept away all the old traditions of constitutional order and good governance to restore the realm to a healthy state there was needed the hard discipline of a century of rule by the strong-handed house of tudor End of chapter 14 recording by pamela nagami in encino california july 2017 end of england and the hundred years war by charles william chadwick omen